We are back. Welcome back to the Flow Grappling Grappling Bulletin Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Corey Stockton, here with Connor Josh and Connor. Been a little bit. How you been, man? Man, I've been good. We just got done with the holidays, and now Christmas gift. I got put up on the front desk of a brand new podcast. It's kind of nice. Season two starting off well. I like it a lot. Welcome up back here. You get a full perspective of the uh, the jiu-jitsu world. We uh, lots going on in the last last couple months since we've been off air. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, huge ADCC season, the IBJJF Nogi season, uh, Nogi season. Uh, so much to talk about, but let's look right into, I think, the recent news, right? There's uh, there's plenty going on in the jiu-jitsu world. The 2023 season is just about to kick off in the IBJJF and Exciting stuff. elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't wait. So l- let's get to, to some of the uh, the more recent news. The Melky Galvao team is now their own official team. They left Fight Sports as they announced last week. Uh, what do you think about the change? Well, I, for one, love it. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. Uh, these really successful teams that... They may be a part of a different affiliation originally, but you know they've kind of built up their brand. They've they've built up their stable of athletes, and now they've justified their reason, saying, "No, we're going to put our own stamp on it. This is actually the Melky Galvao brand of jujitsu, and I love for what it does for the sport." Yeah, and, and talk about a stable of athletes, right? Mm-hmm. The Melky Galvao team, Melky Galvao Jiu-Jitsu, as they're now going by, uh, features three world champions from a couple different organizations, right? You have ADCC world champion Diogo Hayes, you have IBJJF champion Miki Galvao, and also IBJJF tra- champion. Champion Fabricio Andre, as well as uh, Brenda Larissa, uh, Nathaniel Jackson, and a couple of others. Right, the list goes on of all of these really, really decorated champions. Just look at that room. Their grand opening, uh, of course, happening tonight at 8 p.m. local time. Um, but the the gym looks incredible, big space, and good luck to them. They're in uh, Jundiaí, a, a, a city in Sao Paulo. Um, this is going to be their second academy, of course. They're going to keep the academy that they've run successfully for years in Manaus mm-hmm. um, and also now branching out into Sao Paulo. And from what we hear from Melky, they're looking to potentially branch out into uh, the United States in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. That's super exciting. We're over here speculating. Where in the United States could it be? Now, we are based out of Austin, Texas. There's a little bit of love for that, and we want Austin, Texas Jiu-Jitsu just to continue to grow into this mecca. So, me personally, I'm hoping, I'm praying, anything we can do to get Melky here in Austin, Texas, get that team more on who's number ones, you know, more involved with us. That's my thoughts, but where do you think they may go? I mean, it's really, uh, I'm, I'm curious whether they decide to enter into one of those already hotbeds, right? Like Austin, Texas, a hotbed for Jiu-Jitsu or San Diego, or whether they decide to go somewhere that's maybe a little bit less populated as far as Jiu-Jitsu is concerned. The world is wide open, uh, but Melky's really talked about how he wants to to bring this organization and make it not just a, a jiu-jitsu academy, but he called it a jiu-jitsu college, right? Mm. He's looking to, to build his athletes into um, p- professional jiu-jitsu athletes, right? And so that comes with not just jiu-jitsu, but marketing and strategy and English and all of the skills that will make them, um, like like I said, not just not just athletes, but professional athletes. Yeah. Um, I don't want to deviate too far away from the uh, the fight fight sports split without talking about uh, what Melky had to say here. He gave us a uh, a little bit of a quote, so uh, we're going to show that up here. Melky says. We have decided that from now on, we will walk alone. We will be grateful for everything Fight Sports has done for us, uh, but we are no longer part of that part of the team. It is the first time in more than 10 years of our project that I have decided not to join a large team in order to have financial resources. And of course, Melky uh, and his team have been part of Alliance in the past. They've been part of Dream Arts in the past. They joined Fight Sports in mid-2021. And a lot of that mutually beneficial for those teams, right? Those teams get the, po- get the points and the gold medals and the recognition and the, the top-level athletes, whereas Melky and his squad get the financial resources to be able to travel from event to event and seminar to seminar and, and really support themselves. But Based off, I can only imagine the success of Mika and Fabricio and Diogo and others, they can now support themselves enough to where they can represent themselves, which I imagine has been a long time dream for Melky Yaba. Yeah, and I expect that to be a little bit of a larger trend as we continue to see these kind of teams bubble up and see so much success. If you look at the IBJJF leaderboards after one of these majors, it's usually you know filled up with the kind of teams you expect to see. There's going to be Alliance, there's going to be some Gracies there, there's going to be Atos, etc. But 
as these large scale affiliations are seeing success from maybe one or two parts of their team, it's going to make sense for those parts of the team to go, hey, let's do our own thing. And and maybe that'll shake up the IBJJF leaderboard in a lo- much larger way. I mean, I think Heath Pedigo on the Pedigo Submission Fighting Group is trying to do a very similar thing, you know, putting small names up there next to the Atoses and next to the Alliances. So, you know, I think this is going to be a beautiful start for kind of another storyline there of a new team breaking out but you know how many teams get to do that with the kind of you know the stable of three top tier foundational fighters in Fabricio Diogo and Mika that Melky gets to do it in yeah and we'll get to see how how this team performs fortunately in just a couple of weeks right there they're making uh their their IBJJF major debut as a team Mm -hmm. at the European Championships which takes place in France on January 22nd through 29th but you'll be going to France right you get to hang out in France we'll be we'll be headed out to France headed out to France covering from the ground um and I'm sh- a lot of big teams, a lot of big names uh, registered for this event, but mm-hmm. including three athletes from Melky Galvao Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, we have Brenda Larissa and then, of course, Diogo Hayes and Fabricio Andre, who will be uh, sharing the featherweight division. Again. Again, uh, yeah. Another division that they're going to be signing up for. And potentially, I mean, I don't think it's crazy to expect them to – close this out or at least meet in the finals but who knows how that actually plays out yeah the the division of course is stacked right a, mm-hmm. co- a couple of really highly decorated athletes inc- including the irishman sam mcnally mm-hmm. uh the world champion uh shane jamil hill taylor uh many others but wouldn't be surprised to see both fabricio and diogo on the podium they at least have to be favorites to hit the podium i mean if not to make it all the way to the finals but some of those names that you called out are really interesting i know sam someone who put uh himself on the radar pretty pretty openly at adcc with a win over gary tonin uh, i'm not sure it, how sam will stack up with these guys or if they've stacked up before but uh, that should be a really interesting storyline for a lot of the jiu-jitsu world to be paying attention to i believe sam mcnally hit the podium at euros last year i, I could be wrong there but I, I remember seeing him on the podium uh, so yeah this this euros is as stacked as as we've seen in a while um i want to i want to get into what we're looking at at euros right because euros is just a couple of weeks away um and euros is not just the you know one of the major events yeah but it's the start of the 2023 season. Kicking right? it all off. Right. And with that comes this tremendous opportunity for athletes to start their role toward the Grand Slam. Now, what's go ahead. the Grand Slam, Thank Corey? You, <laughs> I've, I've just gotten into jujitsu recently. Maybe I like only ADCC, or maybe I, you know, I have a passing knowledge. If I'm trying to get into the IBJJF season as a fan, what do I need to know about the Grand Slam? So. We often revere athletes who won world champions, uh, who won worlds as world champions, right? Mm-hmm. And that that seems to be the pinnacle of IBJJF Jiu Jitsu for good reason. World champion makes sense, yep. but there is one title that I think, because maybe you don't get a, a specific medal for it or you don't get a specific award for it, people tend to overlook, and that is uh, the, a Grand Slam winner, somebody who's won all four of the major events on the IBJJF circuit in the same year. That being the Europeans coming up in a couple weeks, uh, Brasileiros, Pans and Worlds. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's only been done a couple of times. Last year was kind of an exception in that two different athletes both won a Grand Slam. That was Gabby Pisania, who double Grand Slam the first time in history, Mm -hmm. and Maisa Bastos. But across the history of Jiu-Jitsu, I can only think of maybe five athletes. um, Gabby Pisania, Maisa Bastos, uh, Tayani Porfirio, Rafael Lovato Jr., and Ruben Charles. Cobrina. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and this is one of those, like, obviously, world champions is easy to revere those guys. But this is something for the true jujitsu nerds that if you're following every IBJJF major, those are really the only people that are going to know it as well. It's kind of an elevated step up. You know, there's lots of world champions. There's lots of uh, weight classes. They do it every year. But you're putting yourself in the elite of the elite category by even being talked about for being able to win a Grand Slam. Right. And I don't want to devalue what a world champion what a world championship title means, of course, right? Of it's it, to, to win a world championship title, you have to be the best. Mm-hmm. But specifically, you have to be the best on that day, mm-hmm. right? And that that in itself is hard enough to do. But to be the best, to be the best on that day, four different days in a row mm-hmm. across three different continents, mm-hmm. is a real testament to just the the insane level of of dominance you have to have and Gabby Pisania who we just see just saw here uh, winning wor- winning Euros last year winning double gold at Euros is probably the most dominant athlete 
in in any of the female divisions on the scene right now. Of course, she's double golded in every major event mm -hmm. in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that's that's only talking about the IBJJF majors. Because let's keep in mind, a lot of these athletes are also doing just random opens. They're doing as much as they can to put points on the board to make sure they're getting mad time. And they're dominating those as well, no matter who they're running into. And it's really scary. If you see those names in your division, you got to know that you have a either a war or a beatdown coming your way. And th there are several athletes, I think, who this year have a, a considerable opportunity to complete a Grand Slam this year. Gabby Pisania, as I just said, being one of them, um, if you win a double Grand Slam in 2022, the chances that you're not going to do it in 2023 without anybody getting in your way are, are pretty... Can we... Can we pause there too because i want to point out we've talked about you know winning the grand slam being you win your weight category at all the majors gabby did it not only in her weight category but she also took on the absolute am i wrong there no absolutely correct she uh she won the super heavyweight division and the absolute title in four different events last year four of the major events last year uh, i don't i don't how many people have done that before Is there... no Gab gabby's the first black belt to do it wow yeah which uh, of course an exceptional feat, but I want to get through maybe a couple of athletes who we think could uh, could also achieve the essentially unthinkable and hit a grand slam this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to start, I think, with uh, with who do we start with here. Oh man. Um, okay, so there's so there's some easy names we can call out. Gabby being one of the easy names. I'm going to set those aside. But I know someone you were super excited about talking about earlier was. Talison Soares, would you like to talk about him? Break that down for me. Yeah, why, so, you, why is he your favorite? So Talison's really interesting here. Of course, he's a world champion as of last year. He also won Nogi Worlds last year, but that's a different story. Uh, he won Euros last year. Last year, he took second at Pans. But what he's done at Black Belt is comparable to what he did at the Color Belt. He he was the only athlete I can think of who's won, uh, who's won a Grand Slam at every single belt level. Blue, purple, brown, and now... He has the opportunity to do it this year at Black. He's registered for Euros. He won Euros last year. He is one of the most dominant forces at the in the roosterweight division, um, gi, no gi, whatever it is. And now uh, flying under the uh, under the flag of AOJ, I think that just adds a little bit of, um, yeah, uh, just a little bit of force behind him. If if he's looking to complete the Grand Slam, I think he's proven that he has to be one of the favorites to do it. Yeah, and let's call out like like we said, this is about being the guy on that day, and this is a lot of days you got to show up and and kind of be that person. So right now, if we're looking for you know, if we just look at the entire roster of who we think is going to take part in the IBJJF season this year, and we're trying to figure out who's good enough, that's a hard task. But then it's who's good enough for all of them, and who signs up for them, right? But after Euros, we're going to figure out. That list is going to get cut down quite a bit to what, 18 people? Is that correct? Yeah, I think 18 max, right? So if you look at the Euros roster right now, any black belt adult who signed up has the potential to complete a grand that's slam, you. right? You, that's you. <laughs> okay. Most likely not. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but, but these guys have the potential to complete the grand slam. After the first gold medals at Euros are given out, or, or excuse me, are won, after mm -hmm. those first gold medals are won, um, there's 18 people max who still have the potential to win the next three titles, right? And that list tends to get smaller and smaller as uh, they face different opponents on different days and in different countries. Um, it's very hard to keep doing. But one athlete who I think we need to single out, who is probably everybody's favorite to win the Grand Slam if he decides to pursue it, is Tynan Dalpera. That's a big if there, because he has not been competing in Brasileiro, at least last year. Is that correct? Right. So Tynan won Worlds in 2021. He mm -hmm. won Worlds in 2022. He won Euros in 2022. He won Pans in 21 and 22. But since earning his black belt back in uh, back at the end of 2020, he has never competed in Brasileiro. Now, um, I, I remember reading something, Guy Mendes, saying that that, that tournament wasn't uh, didn't have the, in, in Guy Mendes' eyes, prestige that it used to so maybe I'm, I'm misreading that but it seems that that's not the value that they're looking to pursue right now but still i think tying in as dominant as he's been needs to consider pursuing that title mm -hmm. it just it takes him who's already just this historic talent it puts him in a pool of like a smaller pool of historic names 
Yeah, and I think it, that's a very good call out. Um, it, it is kind of like a legacy thing at this point because we've went through our list and we're trying to find people like who do you really think could put up much of a fight against Tynan? Now, uh, Corey just listed off a boatload of credentials over the 21 22 season, which really put him up there at you know top of the world, uh, almost impossible to, to beat, you know, or at least that's what it seems like. But I think we also got to take into account not only how dominant his record looks on paper, but whenever you're watching his matches, even against the best in the world, it doesn't look like he has many holes at all. And when he's not going against the very best in the world, he's putting up sometimes 50 points on people before just deciding to submit them at the end. I mean, the kind of the kind of shows he's putting on in IBJJF it's some of, it's one of the most exciting people to watch, not just most dominant, which we see quite a bit of, you know, people that go into the IBJJF circuit and they're very uh, focused on getting the win, but he does it in style, he does it with finishes, he does it and makes it look like no one else really deserves to be on the mats with him sometimes. You know, when when Gordon Ryan, for example, started using his matches to market his DVDs, right, to market his instructionals, the world went bananas, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, uh, imagine this athlete who's so good that he can um, just use his matches to demonstrate what he wants you to be interested enough to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. Tynan is doing the exact same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Tynan is, you know, let's let's say marketing uh, an instructional on uh, uh, long step passing. Sure. He spams long step passing effectively and cycles cycles himself back into the guard so he can do it again in a different way. Into a world champion. Right, yeah. right. And so Tynan is at this same uh, the same level of consistency and dominance. Uh, I don't think we mentioned it, uh, but Tynan is undefeated in the IBJJF circuit uh, in the last two years. That leaves him 50-0. and 0. His only loss at EUG to Miki Galvao, which was, I think, a, a, a decision or an advantage victory, a narrow victory, but in, in across all competitions, something like 52-1 and one in two years. So when you talk about dominance, like Tynan's Alpera is the person that you expect to win the Grand Slam if it's something he wants to achieve. Um, th there are a couple other names that you know we, we won't harp too much on, but I think Kind of Duarte has the chance to do it, right? Of course. Felipe Andrew, I think, has has an exceptional chance to do it this mm -hmm. year. Maisa Bastos and Ana Rodriguez could both repeat. Um, but there are a couple athletes here who I think could get in the way of, let's say, a Gabby Pisania, mm -hmm. um, a Talos and Sores, a yep. and Dalpera. Um, we were talking about this before, but what do you think about, let's say, Gabby's chances? I think for Gabby, I mean, honestly, it, it sucks to say, but I'm more excited to see if someone can beat her than if she can win another Grand Slam. That's just how dominant she's looked. I would be more surprised if someone's going to be able to actually put her down than I will be if she's up for another time with her, you know, four medals around her around her neck and we're celebrating her again about the same time next year. However, there are some names in there that you got to throw out, one of which being Amy Campo. Amy Campo has done quite a bit on the IBJJF scene. She's been on the scene for a little bit, but she really still Stepped up. Uh, she won ADCC championship here in 2022. Uh, she took down Gabby Garcia, which is kind of a feather in the hat for most people. A lot of people are, they'll take a win against Gabby Garcia and they'll ride off into the sunset because to them, that's almost as good as a world championship right there. But you got to put her on the radar on Gab for Gabby Persania. Potentially, a, a spoiler, a, a bracket buster there. I think Amy Campo kind of comes into every tournament really, truly knowing and believing that she could win it. And that's that's dangerous no matter who you are, even if you are Gabby Pisania. For sure. And I think Amy Campo, um, Amy Campo's been close, right? She she fought Gabby Garcia at the World Championship in the Absolute Division final, losing a narrow decision, a, a narrow victory, um, narrower than, than Gabby normally sees. It was, I think, 2 nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's – Gabby typically blows girls out of the water for Amy as a rookie black belt, undersized rookie black belt, to keep a match with Gabby that close has, I think, really good implications about her future. Um, now, uh, Amy would only really be able to – uh, upset Gabby's path at the absolute Grand Slam, right? But there's another athlete, I think, who could, uh, if she decides to come back to the IBJJF this year, um, upset both uh, both of Gabby's pursuits toward the Grand Slam, and that's Tayani Porfirio. Mm -hmm. We had talked about her just before, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tayani's one of the only people to actually have a win over Gabby Pisania in black belt. 
Yeah, there are two black belts who have beaten Gabby Pisanya thus far, uh, Yara Sores and Tayani Porfirio. Mm-hmm. And Tayani Porfirio is one of those athletes that, because of her size and her strength, she does offer some really unique challenges. Not only that, she's also wildly technical. Let's not forget, any of these women here are black belt, world champion level jiu-jitsu, so nothing to be scoffed at. But that size is just something hard to get over. But um, despite having that win over Gabby Pisanya, um, Gabby Pisanya does well against girls that are bigger than her or have that outsize. We were talking about Gabby Garcia being a little bit of a feather in the cap for a lot of people's uh, you know, jiu-jitsu careers, Amy Campo, Amanda Levy. But let's not forget, Gabby Pisanya threw around Gabby Garcia the last time they were in the gi. So it's not like this kind of size discrepancy that could potentially show up if, you know, Tiani comes up and tries to meet Gabby Pisania on the mats this year in the IBJJF. That's not the end-all be-all. Gabby Pisani is very comfortable with dealing with the size discrepancy. Not only that, she can do it in style. She can win the takedown bouts. She doesn't just play a small man's game and try and out-technical anyone. She goes to war. So I think, you know, Tayani obviously has to be on her radar. It has to be on everyone's radar for a bracket buster. But don't discount Gabby because of the size of the record by any means. I mean, I I fully expect to see potentially another Grand Slam in her in her. Uh, you know, rear view about this time next year. So let me ask you this then, because I, I think I agree with you, right? That um, Gabby Pisania, we have to assume is the favorite, but Tayani has wins over Gabby. Yara has wins over Gabby. So even though Gabby has beaten both of those women as well, they do stand a chance to stand in her way. What about Tyna Dalpra? Oh man, that is very difficult to say. Um, Around, what was it, 2021 Euros, uh, lucky enough, I spent that in Italy. Or was that 2022? 22. 22 Euros we spent in Italy. Uh, we spent a lot of time with Tommy Langecker and his team, and that was kind of the talk, right? Tommy had just lost to Tynan um, the year before at Worlds in the finals, I believe, correct? Mm-hmm. He had been choked from the back, and this is kind of the, the comeback, right? We were all excited. The whole conversation that week was, how will Tommy do against Tynan if they match up again? And I, I got really excited excited for it i put a lot of hope in it just because you know you love to see the the quote-unquote underdog go after it and tynan shut that conversation down um and it's very difficult for me to see people that are i mean there's very few people in the gi that are much better than tommy langacker like it doesn't that is kind of the highest level um and that kind of took a lot of the wind out of me about about betting against tynan you know yeah, Tynan just, he's so exceptionally technical, right? We're, we're seeing him here against, I'm blind, I think that's uh, that's Renato Canuto. Um, yeah, it is Renato Canuto, but mm-hmm. Tynan has been just exceptionally dominant, even against the athletes who give him trouble, right? And I would say athletes like Ronaldo Jr. and Tommy Lenkaker have given him the most trouble, but he still finds a way to dramatically outpoint Ronaldo or to submit Tommy. Mm-hmm. Um, those guys that come after him do bring the fight out of Tynan, but Tynan still finds a way to shut it down. Um, he's he's undefeated in the IBJJF as a black belt for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, you know, the, the question stands, like, who's able to get in his way? Now, um, looking at some of the, the European registrants, and I think we can get more into who's registered for Euros next week, but I was really interested to see, for example, that Espen Matissen, who won at lightweight in mm-hmm. 2020, uh, 2022, decided that even though he's a, he's a European champion at lightweight where he'll face a lot of the same guys, he decided instead to, I I imagine he must be chasing Tynan into lightweight. And let's be clear about this, right? This this is Tynan's weight class, right? Oh, yeah. Somebody who owns a weight class for that long, it's his class yeah. to lose. He's put his stamp on it, and no one moving up to that weight class does so without knowing Tommy's name is stamped onto it. So it really is like a – it's not just a you know a big move as far as competition, but it does feel like a statement by Espen trying to you know take on the best of the best. I mean this is almost like stepping into like – it kind of comes from the same headspace of stepping into the absolute, of just like going out there for the challenge. And let's not forget, Espen and Tommy Langecker – were teammates until you know just recently now they're again i i there's no bad blood there that wasn't like a drama filled breakup or whatever but point being espen was alongside tommy watching him on this pursuit for tying in and now he's going after the same thing and you have to imagine right like these are professional athletes these are the best of the best if there's a challenge out there they're and you're a professional it. athlete you have to go for it yep. that's just the way they're the way they're built right mm-hmm. so of course uh, i'm I'm surprised that we don't see more people step into middleweight. Instead, it tends to, it tends to be 
athletes kind of flooding out of middleweight <laughs> going right either up to medium heavy or going down to lightweight those things happen too yeah. right people want people want the title yeah it's hard um, to it's hard to blame them too once you've taken on tying in for so long and you're like hey man i gave him my everything in 21 and i gave him my everything in 22 now i'd like a world title i don't blame you guys i would probably react a very similar way yeah and and there are a few who are challenging tyne and dalper actively mm-hmm. one athlete who I think is it's important that we say who is, is certainly challenging Tynan Dalpra mm-hmm. is Izaki Bayans. Oh yeah. Now there's some history between these two. Go ahead. Yeah, um they had a very close match last time. I don't think either of them were very happy. We do have a little interview clip here, but Izaki pointed out that most of the match with Tynan ended up being a 50-50 lapel battle, which if you know anything about Gi Jiu Jitsu, you know that is dishonorable i don't i that, that is they don't they don't necessarily um gloat about that kind of match yeah i mean i think athletes do what they have to do to win right it's yep. you know there's a reason that we see athletes crying on the podium when they win worlds right it's because it's the only thing they want in life yeah. you know from the time they're seven eight nine years yeah. old until the time they're 20 25 and win that yeah. medal it's the only thing they've ever wanted so if so, that happens with a 50 50 lapel battle right however not exactly easy for us to watch, not easy for us as fans to enjoy. And I think mm-hmm. uh, even even the athletes, after recognizing that, wish it was better. Let, let's hear from Izaki. Absolutely. There you go. Ten and Opera beat me. Everybody asks me, hey, what do you think about China? And I always say, man, I don't know. We fight like 90 minutes in a 50 feet with La Pella. Of course, it's a jiu-jitsu. He can do that, but I think he... Uh, he's growing a lot, and uh, we can do better than the last time. I saw he just beat one, one world champion, uh, was me. I, I, I don't think have a lot of good athletes in the same level of him. Of course, we have a make a go vote, but this match don't happen. And I'm here. I, I want to challenge myself, and uh, I think it is the fight makes sense. For the future, uh, he, he can say, okay, you need to do 181. Okay, I can do 181. And uh, I'm available to fight against him. He put a show for everyone. And uh, I just wanted this to motivation and start challenge myself. I like him, I like the work uh, Joff is to doing. And uh, I want to fight against the best, and I think he's the best. In the moment, and the flow grappling, BJJF, give me this fight. I think that's a fight we would absolutely love to see. And I also want to have you say a few words about your new program. I know you guys just moved. So let's put this uh, this interview clip in context, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Izaki, this was at the October IBJJF Flow Grappling Grand Prix, the medium heavyweight Grand Prix, which mm-hmm. Izaki won. He mm-hmm. submitted Andre Porfirio, and he beat. Uh, Manuel Hibamar, in yep. order to win that title on the same event, uh, uh, Tynan Dalpera had a super fight, which he won by submission. Uh, when Izaki wins his title, he says, hey, hang on. I know my next fight. I know who I want next. Give me Tynan Dalpera. So um, uh, March 3rd, the IBJJF and Flow Grappling right here uh, in our studio, we'll be having uh, the, the second edition of the IBJJF Flow Grappling Grand Prix. The Grand Prix will feature a lightweight division in uh, a men's eight men GP and a women's eight woman heavyweight GP. But the main event super fight will be a 30 minute match between mm-hmm. Izaki Bayens and Tynan Delpera. That's exciting. And I, I want to call out, we had talked about what Melky's trying to do with his team over there of, you know, building out athletes, not just athletes as in terms of like how good your jujitsu is, but also doing media, you know, learning how to do call outs and Izaki, man, you're, you're showing the world how to do it. If you're an athlete and you're a jiu-jitsu athlete and you want on these shows, uh, you know, you want to you wanna really make a name for yourself, you want to build storylines, this is the perfect way of doing it. He, he made his call out on one GP, and the next GP he's getting, you know, the exact fight he wants. That's kind of how you make it happen right there. Yeah, jiu-jitsu is all about the squeaky wheel method, right? And, and Izaki, Izaki knows what he wants. He knows he wants this rematch. He believes he can beat Tynan Zalbra, who we've just been talking about as, you know, one of the most uh, – dominant champions in the last couple of years of course izaki as the champion he is the 2018 ibjf world champion he wants that match he's coming after it uh this 30 minute rule set is is especially strange given that both of these athletes um are pretty insistent they're not going to want to do want anything to do with that 50 50 lapel guard we love to see it but that means 30 minutes 
30 minutes without those kind of stalling, slowing, uh, slow down That's style tie ups, time. you would imagine it's going to end in submission one way or the other. You got to hope so. Um, but I think I think the thing that makes me really excited about it is that kind of call out that happens. You don't call someone out and then drop back into the 50 50 lapel. And I think it also comes from kind of like an un, uh, understanding of if you're trying to do jujitsu math, like we are, because at the end of the day, we're just trying to predict who's going to win based off of records and et cetera. The 50 50 lapel really blows up your jujitsu math because it just seems to have so little to do with a lot of the rest of the kind of game that we're trying to play. So I don't even know, you know, if you look back at the Aizaki versus Tynan match, I don't even know how to factor that in when I think about previewing their upcoming match in March. Yeah, and, and that match, right, it was, let, let's let's call it as it is, it was difficult to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they spent nine minutes in that 50 50 lapel guard, and really the, the decision was made in the very last six seconds of the match where a little bit of a controversial decision, right? Tynan came up and uh, looked like he was going to sweep Izaki. The situation went out of bounds. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say whether it was the right, the wrong or indifferent call, but uh, it was a controversial call at the time because Izaki was scored two points against for fleeing the mat. So again, that was the call. I have no real perspective on it one way or the other, but that's not how you want to lose no. or win a mm -hmm. world championship title especially your first world championship title yeah and i think that's why these kinds of grand prix style like uh shows are going to be really interesting because at the end of the day there is just so much on the line when you finally make it to the finals of a world champion bracket like you don't necessarily want the idea of maybe my match is a little bit boring to get in the way of the grand prize but here there isn't that kind of thing on the line what's on the line is obviously prize money and pride and these guys you know you're gonna put it out there i don't think anyone's gonna want you know the same kind of slow match and there's no incentive for it Absolutely. what's what's gonna be incentivized is super exciting jujitsu that you know whenever you get up and you get your submission and you hop on the mic the next time it makes sense for you to make the next call out and have your next match already lined up IBJJF Flow Grappling Grand Prix going down March 3rd. We still have two huge brackets and a couple of super fights yet to announce, but the main event, Izaki versus Tynan. Let's talk about a couple of events that are kind of a little closer on the horizon. I want to start Let's off start. with the uh, finishers, 125-pound Grand Prix, and none other than Grace Gundrum is, uh, is slated to make her return. She's been uh, a little bit of a hiatus since September 2021 when mm -hmm. she took second at the Who's Number One Championships, but happy to see Grace Gundrum back. Oh, man, she's got to be one of the most exciting people to watch. And that's because uh, she just leaves it all in her jujitsu to do the talking for her. She, You probably won't get any words out of her if you ever do get to meet her. I'm told she's very nice, but uh, realistically, there's just very few people in the world that seem to be able to roll with her to give her a good challenge. Um, you know, And she's always looking for the sub. She doesn't really play around too much with trying to get a – a points or decision win. She's always looking for the finish. What can you not, you know, what can you ask for from a jujitsu athlete besides that? Yeah, the, the silent assassin, Grace Gundrum. Uh, she is moving up just a little bit in weight to this 125 pound bracket at mm -hmm. the um, at the Finishers Open GP. Uh, also in that event, Alex Enriquez, the recent Nogi Pan champion. Uh, Alex Enriquez has had a, a tremendous year as well. She took uh, a, a medal spot at the uh, ADCC trials, the East Coast trials. Uh, mm -hmm. Alex Enriquez has been really on a tear. She's, she's looking great. So they're not the only two women in this, in this division, but the format, a little bit interesting. So it's an eight-woman, 125-pound round robin. So they're going to be doing it in two uh, two separate sects. Think of the way Kasai used to do their tournaments, right? Mm -hmm. Where the group A, round robin there, group B, round robin there. Oh, and the, the winner of each of those brackets will face each other in the final. So you can't say for certain we haven't seen the brackets or the, the sections yet that Grace and Alex will be uh, will be separated, but you imagine these two are the favorites. Hope at least. Right. Yeah. Alex is the the finisher's 125 pound champion, whereas Grace is six and zero, um, probably the most decorated uh, finisher's female competitor so far. So I would hope they're on separate sides. We get to see that them in the final, but more importantly, we get to see. Three matches of Grace Gundrum, then the final. Three matches of Alex Enriquez, then the final. So plenty of action coming. Plenty of super fights announced for that card as well. Um, more to come. That happens. That goes down on Sunday the 15th. Yeah, and Alex Enriquez hasn't only been doing trials. She's also been tearing up the IBJJF circuit for quite a while. Every, every Nogi IBJJF major I end up at, I always see her just 
taking someone's neck home with her. So it'll be super fun, great competition. And I'll also, you know, we get we get Grace. We get Grace. We get a little bit of the friend of the show, Zach Maslani, is going to be there. We Maybe he'll give us a good WWE promo. Who knows? I hope so. You can always expect that <laughs> from uh, from Zach. Um more high-level women's jiu-jitsu coming out on the on the 14th of January on Saturday. Uh, Helena Krivar, who just moved to New Wave, joining uh, joining John Donaher, Gordon Ryan, and co. training under the New Wave flag, uh, will be taking on the Purple Belt Nogi World Champion, Nora Schultz. She just won double gold at Nogi Worlds as a Purple Belt. Um, they're fighting at Combat Sports Coverage 8 on Saturday. Yeah, I think that Helena move to uh, New Wave may be one of the maybe more or less discussed um, you know, moves, especially, you know, we're talking about Melky Galvao and that new team and that's huge. But I think Helena could be one of the like, you know, um, underdog, dark horse kind of shakeups that we see this season. Um, I think having her under a really high level professional jujitsu team is going to, you know, she's already seeing so much success. She went to ADCC trials and is just taking everyone's neck home with her. She did the, showed up at the open. She is uh, still a teenager competing with full grown women, black belts, and making them look like she deserves their black belt. Like she should take it home with them, and, and that should be the end of it. And it's super exciting to see, you know, she, this is just the next level. This is the next step. But I, I'm curious, what do you think we're going to see from her this next year? I mean, I, I'm really just constantly impressed by how good she looks against top talent. I mean, uh, Fight to win last year, she she had a very close match with uh, Bree Robertson. Mm -hmm. um, she also had a very close match at um, at ADCC Trials against uh, Liz Clay mm -hmm. at the ADCC Open. She went, I think, to a, I think she went to a decision with Natalie Hibero. Yeah, Tata. Yeah, crazy man. So I'm constantly impressed. I think uh, the the instruction of John Donaher and you know in a training room with people like Gordon Ryan, Luke Griffith can only serve to benefit her. I, I think the, the, the quote's pretty popular at this point. Uh, John Donaher saying something to the effect of that uh, he wishes he had created or had the opportunity to create a female world champion, right? I think Helena Kravar, just 15 years old, has plenty of potential and plenty of opportunity to work her way up there. And with, with John Donaher at the helm, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, Nora Schultz, no joke, right? She submitted everybody on the day at Nogi Worlds in the Purple Belt Division. Uh, that's double gold. She is very, very talented uh, uh, from Germany through Australia. Uh, has been spending the last couple of weeks in the States. Um, I, I think it'll be a very tight match, but it'll be a good test for exactly where uh, Helena Kravar stands. Exactly. And if any of our viewers are confused as to maybe who Helena is, any tournament she's at, just go find the one with the craziest rash guards. It'll always be a matching rash guard, and then she'll probably put her hair in pigtails. The iconic pigtails. Yeah, and it will just feel so disrespectful as she goes through and takes out the whole bracket. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, I mean, I think she's probably got recruited by Donna Hair for her rash guard game. I'm sure that was a big part of it, um, as we can all agree. But, uh, yeah, super exciting matchup. Uh, she could be the future of women's jiu-jitsu um you know obviously a lot of time to tell she still has a lot of majors that she needs to uh, put her stamp on as an adult but it's hard to have a better start to your jiu-jitsu the career than what she's established for herself i have to fact check this but i think she may be eligible to compete uh at I think she is uh, eligible to compete at Blue Belt in the IBJJF this year, so uh -oh. we might finally get to be able to see her. At Blue Belt? Yeah. That's horrifying, dude. <laughs> that's horrifying. Blue Belt better watch out. No. So that's Saturday, Combat mm -hmm. Sports Coverage 8. On Sunday, like we mentioned, uh, finishers sub only, the 125-pound Grand Prix. On Thursday, the 12th, we are unveiling the winners of the Flow Grappling Awards. The voting has been closed. Mm -hmm. All the votes are in. You guys came out in droves to vote for your favorite fighters, your favorite submissions, your favorite matches. Uh, but on Thursday, we'll make the announcements official. Um, let's talk about the awards. I, I think we want to tee up. Uh, let's get into Match of the Year. Let, let's see oh, who, uh, who we nominated for Match of the Year. Match of the Year is always so fun, uh, but it's probably one of the more difficult ones to, to remember. Cade Ruto versus PJ Barch. The whole crowd went wild at this one at ADCC. One of many great matches, but this one ended with a wild submission as well. Cade up for his second nomination. Uh, his second nomination. He won it last year. Gordon Ryan versus Felipe Pena, of course. Uh, one of the most storied rivalries oh, in jiu-jitsu, and this match 
Uh, a little a little strange ending, but did not disappoint. Of course, we're going to be seeing the rematch of that one soon. Speaking of rematches, the rubber match, Fionn Davis versus Dia Mesquita. Uh, they, they went one and one in the last two editions of ADCC, and uh, Fionn came out just guns blazing in this match. Oh, yeah, and the Damian Anderson, Andrew Tackett. This was the footage that kind of got lost from that moment exactly because they decided to take out our camera equipment for one of the most exciting, nail-biting, intense matches. Followed up by Isaac Michelle versus Wagner. Hosh, tell us about this one. Yeah, this one won an award uh, by ADCC for match of the tournament, and just it, absolutely wall-to-wall -wall action. Both guys had each other's backs at a point. Uh, speaking of wall-to-wall, -wall, Nicholas oh. Mergali, Ty Rutolo, this one had the fans on their feet. The Dars. The Thomas and Max Center. Huge takedowns, huge submission threats. So much at stake in this matchup. Um, and one that I hope we see again very soon because uh, a little bit of a contentious ending there. I think uh, the fans thought it went one way or the other way, but really, really close match. Went to referee decision. That's a match we have to see back, and that's why it is clearly a match of the year. Dude, and it is insane to think. Marigali, he, he did what? three who's number one matches before ADCC and then ADCC he had I mean he went through not just his division but also the absolute and Ty Ruotolo I believe is the guy who made him look human he's the person who got him closer to a finish than he's I've seen Guy or no Guy uh, and it looks like he kind of pushed him further to the brink obviously he didn't uh Marigali didn't get the win over Yuri Samoys in the absolute final however that was you know I don't think even that looked nearly as impressive of a victory for Yuri as uh Ty's loss looked for Ty so yeah I, I incredibly agree with you Ty has this ability to humanize uh, athletes who are considerably bigger than him and I think it's just you know that comes with you know, being a, being a twin brother, being a Rutolo, <laughs> I think it comes with just like being a, a lifelong killer, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are, I'm sure, plenty of matches that we missed on this list. Right? Oh, we, so could, we could only get six in there in the nominees list, uh, but I think we should draw attention to just a couple. What match did we leave off that you need that you wish you had seen on that list? Man, I wish I could take credit for this one, but Corey did put me onto it, and I went back and I rewatched it. I think on Friday or Thursday last week, Samuel Nagai versus Fabricio Andre. It was an IBJJF match. They traded a lot, a lot of techniques, and obviously these are two of the most exciting kind of styles you can find for IBJJF athletes. Fabricio Andre, obviously wildly athletic, um, you know, some of the best footwork in the game, some of the strongest wrestling in the game. And Samuel Nagai, who can drag anyone into a technical exchange that you think you can win, but oftentimes it turns out it's a lot more difficult once you're wading into those waters than maybe you originally thought. Sam Nagai, one of the unsung heroes, I think, of the featherweight division. Mm -hmm. Persistently underrated, and I think it's just such such a mistake to overlook Sam Nagai. Um, of course, Nagai won that match. He went on to, uh, to take a medal at Worlds. A match for me that sticks out at that same event. Uh, Victor Hugo versus Gutenberg Pereira. Mm -hmm. uh, Gutenberg was pretty heavily ahead in this match until the final couple of seconds when Victor Hugo just showed us what a world champion does, right? And pulled out all the stops, uh, ended up on top. But it's just this this grinding, grinding match. A match, you know, when we, when we think about matches in the ultra heavyweight division, sometimes we think about a little bit slower pace, right? A little bit more calculated because every inch matters. But... I've had the pleasure of uh, of rolling with Victor Hugo a couple times, and the, he out little guys me. You know, he just like <laughs> he he plays this this technical game that I expect to see from people that are like my size or smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor is twice my size, and mm -hmm. somehow he's uh, just able to find these technical this yeah technical positions, technical angles that just blow my mind. He was able to do that against Gutenberg Pereira, who's uh, the same size as Victor. So. Incredible matches, really, really crafty scrambles and great grit from Victor Hugo. Yeah, and I think that quality about him of making it look like a small man jiu-jitsu match is probably what sets most high-level athletes at that weight class apart. I mean, Gutenberg Pereira does also a great job of it. I think it's something Felipe Andrew does all right with it, of just making sure that, you know, there is a there is a smash-style jiu-jitsu that is a little bit simpler for big guys to engage in because that's kind of what comes natural but being able to play against that type and then drag people into you know deep waters where submissions are everywhere that's what victor hugo and these felipe andrew and gutberg all do fantastic so you got to give them credit for that that is fantastic to do and it's also really fun to see when you're six foot eight and you can do that for that's sure. crazy we could go on and on i think about some of the other matches that should have would have could have been been uh, been nominated for match of the year but 
that I think we should also take a look at submission of the year. Oh yeah, there's gonna be some crazy ones here. Some of which you'll notice immediately. Diego Pato breaking out the Z-Lock. Obviously this is a Junio Casio special, but doing it like it's kind of a Masi on such a big CC speed. on wow. the big stage. Of course, the Suloev stretch, the oh. Josh Cisneros. Stretch. He hit this twice, and I read, read an interview with him later. Said he had never hit this move in competition or in training before. Just so breaks it out at the biggest tournament he's ever done. Yeah, and then you gotta really take into account J Rod's entire run. This buggy choke, obviously in the finals, being probably one of the more iconic moments. But man, he he surprised everyone. What about that this whole crafty armbar that had my head in knots mm -hmm. for for months after uh, after the ADCC South American Trials, the Coyote by Mika. And then the, oh, another armbar, speaking of dynamic armbars, the Heisen Rita armbar over Cyborg that set the Thomas and Max Center into a frenzy. Oh yeah, and that really did set the mood for the rest of the weekend, which culminated in this fantastic match. Yeah. God, oh, Andre Galbao versus Gordon Ryan. It's a match we all waited for, and Gordon Ryan looked absolutely dominant in there. I want to point out, though, there's a lot of different ways of grading best submission, right? Some of these, like Mika, you can say, hey, that's just so smooth, that's so pretty, it makes me feel like I could do that on my training partner. I can't, turns out, but you know, that's something how we grade it. But then there's some other matches like Heisum versus Cyborg that, you know, that wasn't the prettiest submission in the world, but everyone got set on fire by it. And you know, I, I think there's something to be said for context of why these moments are so great, so dynamic like they are. Yeah, you can really put, um not just these moments, these submissions, but all of the submissions we, we nominated in the, the longer list, right? The, mm -hmm. the 30 submissions we started with into kind of different categories, right? Like you have just powerful moments, right? The Gordon Ryan Renika choke over yep. Andre Galvao, the Hyacin Rita armbar over Cyborg. You have these like um, powerful moments with unique submissions, like mm -hmm. Josh Cisneros solo left stretch, uh, like uh, uh, the, the buggy choke, or like the Z-lock. Mm -hmm. And then you just have exactly like, those, how did that happen? How is that possible? That's the prettiest thing I've seen in jiu-jitsu in a while, that Mika Galvao Coyote arm lock and so many others, right? I think you could lump in, let's say, like Isaac Dodderline's uh, foot lock over Sam the Guy at Worlds. Mm -hmm. You can lump that in there too because it was just like this culmination of incredible technique, really smooth, really well thought out technique, not a mind-blowing, um, you know, it's, it's a submission that we've all seen before, but just... Yep. But the stakes were so heavy, were so high. The moment was perfect. The way he found it, the way he won that match, the the, mo the stakes of that match, the last time those two had faced off, Sam the guy kind of beat the brakes off of, off of Isaac, and then Isaac turned it around and you know, pulled out this beautiful footlock, which he's famous for. Yeah, and there was a few others on there that you know maybe didn't make the list, but man, you got to give them credit. I think some of them were calling out. Um, for example, one of them was Luke Griffith on who's number one, really coming out against uh, Joe Deerkeising. Now, obviously, contextually, it's not as big as the like, ADCC finals or whatever the case is, but it was such a come-out moment for uh, Luke Griffith and really put himself on the big stage. I'll also call out J-Rod, um, the match before, uh, the one that just came on against Mike Crisp, I think is just as beautiful as anything else. Now, I'm a wrestler, right? So maybe I'm one over because the duck under was so beautiful. That super duck is burned into my memory forever. Oh my god, what can you do about that? Yeah. So so maybe I'm giving the submission a little bit more credit because of just the beautiful setup with it, but there's just so many moments where you, you know you can't take any Sophia Casella taking out uh who was it? Jessica Con? Jesse Crane. Jesse Crane. Jesse, Jesse Crane, excuse Jesse me. Jesse Crane, yeah. Sophia Casella coming out on the who's number one stage making her debut. I believe that was a knee bar finish. Just beautiful, beautiful technique all around in twenty twenty two. Which reminds me you mentioned a couple here that are um, the fastest or some of the fastest ever on who's number one. Um, you can go into our ranking sections on flowgrappling.com, check out the fastest submissions on who's number one. It breaks it down by division, by weight category, uh, by submission type. So there are a number of different ways that we've sorted through the fastest submissions on who's number one. Really cool project we put together, keeping track of these historic moments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the Hyacin Rita armbar, the Luke Griffith heel hook over Hyacin Rita, of course, that famous Nikki Ryan heel hook over... Um, Nicky Ryan he'll hook over Tony Ramos. Over Tony Ramos. Oh, no. There we go. The most controversial match in who's number one history, Tony Ramos getting heel hooked in what, 10 seconds? Uh, 23. 23? 23. 23. Make it 10 seconds. Yeah. Close enough. Close enough to 10 seconds. Yeah. 
Anyway, those are just two of the categories uh, that are up for award at the Flow Grappling Awards, which will be announced on Thursday. We're also featuring Breakthrough Grappler of the Year, Male Grappler of the Year, and Female Grappler of the Year. Um, so all the voting's been done, but make sure you tune in live on Thursday to find out who won. And I think that's going to be it here for Season 2, Episode 1 of the Grappling Bulletin Podcast. Dang, um, look at that. We did it, boys. We made it through. Yeah. Uh, so tune in next week. We'll be breaking down Euros a little bit further, taking a look at some of the divisions, some of the biggest athletes. Um, and, yeah, stick with us throughout the rest of the season as we follow all of the grappling news. Uh, tune in live on Flow Grappling to watch all the events we mentioned today. And uh, we'll catch you next Monday. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, everybody.